Henry Kissinger was one of the most controversial and influential political figures in American history. He advised 12 presidents over the course of his career, a little over a quarter of all the presidents in American history. For more than half a century, his fingerprints were all over American foreign policy. Sometimes those fingerprints were found on bridges he built between nations, but often they were found at some of the most gruesome crime scenes in modern history. Was he a policy innovator or a war criminal, or maybe both? Nobel Peace Prize. After becoming Nixon's national security advisor and eventually Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger was off and running. He played key roles in conflicts all over the world. He went on secret missions to China, helped orchestrate coups in Chile and Argentina. He intervened in Israel's Yom Kippur War and the Bangladesh Liberation War. He played a role in Indonesia's occupation of East Timor. He messed around with Cuba, the Western Sahara Desert, Zaire, Brazil's nuclear program, North and South Korea, the Soviet Union. Oh yeah, and let's not forget about Cambodia and Vietnam. For the last one, Vietnam, Kissinger was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his role in the Paris Peace Accords in 1973 that ended the war and helped everyone live happily ever after. <laughs> yeah, right, just kidding. The peace treaty was highly criticized. Peace was never really attained in the region, and Kissinger and the U.S. policies of carpet explosions that blanketed the region for years were some of the most destructive in the history of warfare. The American initiative was led by President Nixon's special advisor, Dr. Henry Kissinger. Since 1970, he has met North Vietnamese leaders 12 times. At their meetings, he offered much of what the communists demanded. But still, in 1973, Kissinger and his North Vietnamese counterpart, Le Duc Tho, were both given the prestigious award. It was probably the most scandalous Nobel Peace Prize award in history. Two committee members resigned out of protest. Le Duc Tho outright just refused to accept the award, saying that real peace had not been achieved at all. Kissinger did accept it, but donated the prize money to organizations helping the orphaned children of American soldiers killed during the war. Two years later, Kissinger reportedly tried to half-heartedly return the award. No word on whether he kept it on display in a glass case in his study, along with his other awards like the Presidential Medal of Freedom, which he was given in 1977, or his National Book Award for his memoir, The White House Years, or his honorary knighthood given to him by Queen Elizabeth II, or his French Legion of Honor. Cowboy Kissinger a year before Kissinger's controversial Nobel Prize, he gave an interview that he later called one of the worst mistakes of his career. He thought his sit-down with Italian journalist Oriana Falacci would be a cakewalk. But Falacci turned out to be one of the best interviewers of her day and got Kissinger to say some things that turned into a public relations nightmare and made Nixon so mad he almost fired him. Looking back on the interview now, it gives us some insight into Kissinger's near fanatical focus on individualism and the idea that people don't need the help of anyone else to get things done. Do, do you think you got the interview with, with uh, Dr. Kissinger because you were a woman? Would that have tipped the balance somewhat? Oh no, on the contrary. Uh, Dr. Kissinger was uh, a little worried about the fact that uh, I was a woman. At one point during the interview, Falacci got Kissinger to admit that he thought Vietnam was a useless war, something that didn't go down well. He also said he enjoyed having dinner with the North Vietnamese politician Le Duc Tho more than the South Vietnamese president and ally Nguyen Van Thieu, another statement that made Americans in support of the war gasp. Then at another point, he compared himself to a cowboy in an almost comical way. Here's part of what he said. I've always acted alone. Americans like that immensely. Americans like the cowboy who leads the wagon train by riding ahead alone on his horse. The cowboy who rides all alone in the town, the village, with his horse and nothing else. Maybe even without a weapon, since he doesn't shoot. He acts, that's all, by being in the right place at the right time. In short, a western. That's basically Kissinger's mindset in a nutshell. The world was his own personal wild west. He was the main character, the smartest guy in the room, a man whose words were more dangerous than a weapon. Because who needs a weapon when you're effectively running a government with the largest military the world has ever seen? Secret Trip to China A year before that ill-advised interview, Henry Kissinger kicked off his career as a foreign policy advisor with a secret trip to China. It had all the bells and whistles you'd expect from a top secret mission, complete with a fedora, sunglasses, disguise, and a private jet that may or may not have belonged 
to Frank Sinatra. In 1971, Kissinger ordered the U.S. ambassador to Pakistan, Joseph Farland, to take a quick 24-hour flight over to his house in Palm Springs, California. When the ambassador landed in Los Angeles, Kissinger hooked him up with a private jet that took him out to the California desert. Farland noticed that the ashtrays on the jet were engraved with the name of a pretty well-known guy, Frank Sinatra. Kissinger moved around in some influential circles, both foreign and domestic, political and cultural. It would make sense that the self-proclaimed cowboy had cozied up to the world-famous crooner. Farland made the gauntlet of a journey from Pakistan to Kissinger's home in Palm Springs because Nixon's foreign policy guru wanted to pick his brain about a trip he was planning on making. He and Nixon decided in secret that they wanted to fire up talks with China, secret talks that would probably help them out against the Soviet Union and gain some international support in the ongoing Vietnam War, a war that had very little international support to begin with. Henry Kissinger wanted the ambassador to Pakistan because the best way to sneak into China without anyone knowing was through Pakistan. When Kissinger arrived in Pakistan, he pretended he had a bad stomach and needed a couple days to rest. Disguised in a fedora and sunglasses, he then secretly hopped a plane over the Himalayas and into China. The flight was a tense one. There were a couple of Chinese nationals on the plane that Kissinger's team thought were spies, and one Secret Service agent nearly pulled his weapon on them. But they weren't spies, and Kissinger made it to his destination. In China, Kissinger was blown away. He would say later that he felt like a child. He was impressed by the ancient architecture, the culture, and particularly loved the caviar he was served for breakfast. Now at first, the Chinese were a bit skeptical about the secrecy of his visit, but Kissinger quickly established a rapport with Premier Zhou Enlai. Eventually, the negotiations led to an agreement for a meeting between Nixon and Mao Zedong, China's notorious communist leader at the time. It was a successful trip, but one that had a lot of people skeptical. In any case, when Kissinger returned, Nixon publicly announced his planned visit to China. It was one of Kissinger's first diplomatic achievements, and one of his least bloody or controversial. The Kissinger Report Henry Kissinger was a Jewish man born in Germany during the rise of the Big Mustache Man, or maybe the Little Mustache Man. He was 15 when his family fled the country, after it became clear that things were about to get really ugly. So you would think that when Nixon came to him in 1974, asking him to direct a study that had the words population control in them, he'd be a bit more skeptical. Unfortunately, he dove right in. The result was a National Security Study Memorandum 200, nicknamed the Kissinger Report after, well, the guy who directed it. The conclusion of the study was this. Population growth in less developed countries, or LDS as they call them, was a threat to U.S. national security and economic interest. High population growth could lead to civil unrest and political instability in countries with strategic economic potential, particularly countries that have lots of minerals and resources that the U.S. can take advantage of. The report recommended population control measures, particularly in 13 countries, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Indonesia, Thailand, the Philippines, Turkey, Nigeria, Egypt, Ethiopia, Mexico, Colombia, and Brazil. The population control measures were described as a way to limit potential opposition to U.S. interests, make sure they could get at all those valuable natural resources, and make sure fewer anti-establishment youth were born. No one in the White House wanted another summer of love. The strategy included influencing national leaders and promoting contraception. It suggested that U.S. leadership shouldn't appear coercive or imperialistic and advocated for family planning programs and emphasized development and quality of life improvements. It also suggested they use food aid to help coax some of these countries into implementing population policies that the U.S. approved of. It was an almost literal dangling of the carrot on the stick. Mineral extraction was near the top of the list when it came to the Kissinger Report. It stated that the U.S. economy will require large and increasing amounts of minerals from abroad, especially from less developed countries. That fact gives the U.S. enhanced interest in the political, economic, and social stability of supplying countries. Wherever lessening of population pressures through reduced birth rates can increase the prospects for such stability, population policy becomes relevant to resource supplies. But of course, they needed to carry all this out in a way that looked benevolent. So, and let me quote again, in these sensitive relations, it is important in style as well as substance to avoid the appearance of coercion. Sneaky, real sneaky. Madman Theory. If 
Kissinger was a cowboy, then maybe Nixon was a madman. That's exactly what the president wanted to portray to the rest of the world anyway. Don't mess with a crazy guy with nukes. The idea behind portraying Nixon like this comes from something he called madman theory. Nixon reportedly liked to indulge in booze. He also had insomnia and was prescribed sleeping pills. And sometimes he combined the two together. Not advisable. Also didn't make for a very stable personality. But Nixon apparently embraced it. It was Kissinger's job to bring this madman theory to the diplomatic table. The basic idea was to create the impression that the president was unpredictable and capable of anything, including using the big mushroom cloud inducing arsenal of weapons that the United States had developed. The madman was on the loose. For example, in October 1969, when the U.S. flew bombers armed with thermonuclear weapons near the border of the Soviet Union for three days in a row. Kissinger also used the threat of a crazy guy in office to invade Cambodia towards the end of the Vietnam War, a decision that led to the utter destruction of the country and the rise of Pol Pot. Henry Kissinger was a smart guy. He was also a self-proclaimed cowboy, a man who put American interests ahead of all else, who thought it was you and you alone who could lift yourself up by your bootstraps and make something of yourself. He was the epitome of American individualism. He helped build the U.S. into even more of a superpower than it was after World War II, but he was also the epitome of selfishness, of I'll do me and screw the rest of you. His legacy will remain a controversial one. Thanks for watching. Obviously, we couldn't cover every aspect of Kissinger's career. Explaining his diplomacy during the Chilean coup, the Yom Kippur War, and dozens of other world events would take multiple other videos. But what else do you know about maybe the most controversial American diplomat of all time? Let us know in the comments. And don't forget to like and subscribe for more nutty history.